started. There we go. So welcome everybody. We'll give it another minute or two to fill the seats in before we get started here. You just let me know when you want to go, Ben. All right, Jonathan, it's four o'clock. If you want to go ahead and kick things off, I'm going to go ahead and back out of here. So I'll hand it over to you guys. Thank you very much. Okay. All right, everyone. Um, it's awesome to have you all here with us. Um, as always, I'm going to um, you know, take a little time, uh, do a land acknowledgement, give some basics about uh, kind of the Zoom webinar process. And then I will introduce our speaker for today. Um, so um, let's start with a land acknowledgement. The Crow Canyon Archaeological Center acknowledges the Pueblo, Ute, Paiute, Diné, and Hickory Apache, people on whose traditional homelands this institution sits. Our work would not be possible without indigenous people, period, present and future. We respect we, or past, present, and future, we respectfully recognize and honor ancestral and descendant indigenous communities for their contributions to all humankind. Crow Canyon is grateful to all indigenous people and supports the preservation and protection of cultural traditions, ancestral connections, and sacred lands. Um, I know we are all probably pros at Zoom webinaring and conferencing, uh, but just make sure, please make sure if you've got a question um, to put your question in the Q&A, not in the chat. I'm going to repeat it again, not in the chat. Uh, we, I will not get to it. Um, put it in the Q&A. Uh, if you're having any difficulties, though, remember that we are streaming live over on Facebook as well. Um, and you can always subscribe to our YouTube page to see past videos. Next week, uh, we have our very own Grant Coffey, who's going to talk to us about um, a, uh, using LIDAR in the Central Mesa Verde region. So you got to uh, be sure to check that out. And then the following week, there's little old me. I'll be giving a talk on um, the past two years worth of zooarchaeological research uh, here at Crow Canyon. Um, also, just want to remind you that webinars like this one today are made possible by donations from viewers like you. Um, so if you would like to learn more about donating to Crow Canyon and all the different ways we could use donations to, to support our mission work, you can go ahead and scan this QR code in the bottom left of your screen. I'll keep it here for a few beats uh, in case anyone wants to do that. Um, and then we will go to the next slide. Uh, a reminder that our summer newsletter is here. You can visit our website uh, to sign up for that, crocanyon.org. Um, so let's get to introducing our speaker. Um, so our speaker, speaker today is Bogdan Onak. His research focuses on reconstructing climate and paleoenvironmental changes using ice, guano, and speleothems found in cave and lava tube deposits. He employs stable and radiogenic isotope geochemistry and mineral mineralogy to answer his research questions. Onak's publishing record includes over 180 articles and 12 books. One particular area of his current investigations involves contributing data on past sea level elevations during both warmer and colder periods of Earth's history using carbonate incrustations from littoral caves. Recently, he has undertaken the challenging task of unraveling the history of the Greenland ice sheet using cave carbonates precipitated in caves from the northeastern region of this remote terrain. Currently holding the position of professor of karst geology and paleoclimate in the School of Geosciences at the University of South Florida, Onak continues to push the boundaries of scientific inquiry in his field. So without further ado, we are going to turn it over to Onak. 
Thank you so much for your introduction and thank you very much for inviting me to talk to this webinar. It's a great pleasure to bring you some research that uh, I am conducting for the last uh, four or five years now with, um, <clears throat> let me share the screen, um, in the lava tubes in New Mexico. And yeah, I, I do some similar work in Hawaii, in Iceland, Lanzarote, Azores, everywhere where lava exists. Uh, it's interesting to look for what is inside the lava. But today I'm just going to focus in the Southwest, particularly in the El Mal Pais um, area. Before I start, I'd like to acknowledge the financial support from National Science Foundation and National Park Service, and of course, all the logistics and everything that came up with uh, my collaborators at the uh, El Mal Pais National Monument. And of course, I got lots of support at the University of South Florida and my ma uh, master students who endure the, the cold, the long hours down in the caves to, to get the, the samples out. So the presentation, it's going to kind of focus on <clears throat> a few introductory points, motivation, how ice gets into the lava tubes, and then what specific methods do, I, do we use in order to collect the sample, because that's a uh, challenging issue itself, and then to do the analysis. Uh, how do we get the chronology, because it's essential to have that, and then... At this particular location, we want to show you uh, some uh, research that proves human presence in the lava tubes. And then uh, we will end, I will end with the um, uh, oxygen-based um, paleoclimate reconstruction, uh, which is an ongoing research. And we have one paper that is published and the other one is on the, on the re review. So with the motivations, you know, uh, it's it's a kind of a trendy topic right now. NASA, it's pushing, and not only NASA, but also the European Space Agency, it's pushing very, very hard on getting as much information as possible, understanding the, the, the to the smallest details what are the physical and chemical uh, settings in uh, lava tubes on Earth. And that is just because they started to collect a bunch of great information and data from similar features that are outside Earth. So on this image right here, you have the upper panel, right? You see uh, lava tubes in number of collapses, but you can see how nice the lava tubes go. The same thing you see here, a couple of entrances into the lava tubes and so forth. And then similarly, if you look at the images that are on the lower part, you will find lots of such dots and sometimes lines that goes kind of the same way that you will see on Earth. The points right here, which what the uh, NASA people are calling subsurface access points, these are actually entrance in lava tubes. And so it's a, it's a, it's a topic that really uh, um, kind of geared up over the last five, six years. And that is mainly because uh, Past and present life, if you are looking outside Earth on all these planetary bodies, we might find it in areas that are slightly remote, uh, subsurface, which are protected for radiation, temperature, harsh conditions, and so forth. Water resources, if there is anything, or a water source or whatever, liquid or solid, it's going to be somewhere underneath because of the temperatures and other, other harsh conditions there. It's an ideal space for research and habitation. And right now, we are we are in a big group that uh, are conducting um, training for the astronauts uh, from NASA and from the European Space Agency and how to deal with getting into the lava tubes and how to be prepared in case that they will have a chance to get into one of those on the moon, for instance, as closest one, how and uh, what what they need to observe, what they need to do, and so forth. And of course, uh, there will be uh, another another motivation. But before I'm, I'm moving into the main one that connects to the topic of my uh, presentation, I just want to show an image here. This is a paper that we just recently published, in which we show that the first stage that we start a couple of years ago is the identification of the subsurface access points. And so far we have 1297 such 
cave entries or let's say lava tubes entries as far as Pluto. Okay, and then the second is the, the second stage is going to be the characterization, and it started. Mars and Moon do have lots of particular and precise measurements of the entrance angles of the light, how much you can get inside, how deep it might be, and so forth. And everything is preparing for the final, the third, when the exploration starts. And we believe the first thing will be the robots that will be able to get into the lava tubes. And later on, hopefully humans will climb down in some of these lava tubes and see what's going there. There are many reasons for why, why this, this thing is important. Not only the labs on the on the ground, but then it's also a, a good a good place for training, as I mentioned. And it's ideal. All the lava tubes here on Earth are ideal places to testing all the robots, especially on harsh environment, terrains, and other instruments that we want to make sure that once they are deployed in some of these lava tubes, functions. And then the second major uh, motivation for the for the research in lava tubes is because, like any other subsurface cavity, which is a trap for different types of sediments, it represents a source of paleoenvironmental and climatic uh, information. Not that we will not have similar stuff in um, I don't know speleothems, uh, lake sediments, guano, or whatever else we want to we want to look into. Problem is, in some areas, we do not have a variety, or sometimes we don't have at all any other sources to get back in time and see what the environment was, what the climate was back in time. Hawaii, for instance, we can go only a couple of hundred years. We don't know much about 3,000 years or 4,000 years ago. Okay, In uh, New Mexico, it's not the same. Well, it's, it's in the same uh, with Hawaii in that, for instance, the tree ring studies which are extremely detailed as you can see here you know it's sub annual resolution very very high wet dry periods shows very very nice the only problem is they go back 2500 years period you don't have anything at that kind of resolution beyond 2500 years and in addition uh, what another another thing that uh, <clears throat> makes us looking to other uh, other archives from which we can reconstruct environment and climate, it's because I know, or the, uh, the tree rings in this case, it's giving me an information or whether it was wet, it was dry, how long the dry period, how long the wet period was, but doesn't tell me much about the source, where the water was coming. And that is something that with the stabilizotopes in ice, it's much easier than trying to do anything similar in tree rings. Okay, so for this reason, uh, we were start we we start to look at the at the lava tubes. My background, uh, early times, I used to work a lot in caves with ice inside, and so when I uh, stumbled on the on on the lava tubes in New Mexico, I said, "Wow, that's beautiful! I have the same kind of ice like I have in the caves. Not that big and large blocks like the ones I'm, I used to work, but still now." For some, it's very interesting when you are saying, oh, you are working on ice in lava tubes, how that comes? I mean, lava tubes, everyone, it's obviously associated with volcanoes and you have nice pahoe hoe flows, uh, inflates and then creates a nice hole behind as soon as the eruption is done. So how do we get ice in the lava tubes? Um, I, Throughout here, a couple of genetic models of how uh, lava tubes form. We are not going to go into details, but we want to know it's that the lava tube needs to be emptied by the molten lava that flows through, and it takes some time to cool down before we can have anything else inside. Although some minerals form a year after the eruption ended, uh, but ice, it's definitely not going to show up unless it's cooled down very well. But in addition, if we have only lava tubes like what you see here in the image, long lava tubes, if there is no connection with surface, there will be no ice ever inside the lava tubes. And one other point, point I want to make, in some areas you might find or walk through lava tubes that you, you will have multiple levels. So obviously, either there were several flows, lava flows, or there was one that were cutting into older ones and so forth. 
I will always look for eyes in the lowest of these uh, levels because that would be not only the older one, but probably the preservation. It's going to be better since it's deeper from the surface. So you don't have that heat that it's transfer to that black rock down into the into the cavity underneath. So in order to get some ice form into the cave, we will need something like you see in this image, a collapse. And that is what, you know, here's another collapse, a nice entrance into one of the lava tubes. That collapse, it caused the air to move in a very particular way inside the, the lava tube. So it's this particular ventilation system that generates ice inside. Basically during the winter time, Cold air, it's very heavy and sinks, push out, pushes out all the warm air and create a kind of fridge environment right here. And any water that would drip late spring, late fall, whatever, in between fall and late spring, it will freeze because inside is going to be very cold and it will be sub-zero temperature. In the summertime, because this area is so cold, the hot air, which is drier and the density is much, much uh, low, uh, higher than the, the, cold, the cold air, it will just go a little bit up, hit the, the cold, uh, cold air and comes out. So you will not have really hot air getting all the way into the, into the cave, which means in this area and the lower part, there will be some ventilation going on, but it's just a convection cell that goes around the ice that it's accumulating and all this uh, area that is on the lead, on the lead dotted line stays a nice big fridge. And underneath these conditions, we can accumulate floor ice, what we are calling floor ice deposits that can be the deepest one that we investigated is 26 meters in a cave in Romania. You can have uh, sometimes in uh, in our lava tubes, we found it that um, the most, I think the deepest one was 2.5 meters. We didn't find anything bigger than that. And in this image right here, you can see the ice. It's starting somewhere here. Well, actually it goes a little bit underneath here, but it goes all the way up here. What it said, it's because of the global warming. This image, or so this area right here in this lava tube, we have pictures taken back in the late 70s when the cave was discovered up to last year. And we could we could see how the ice is slowly degrading and melting and moving away. So that was one of the reasons why we applied to NSF and got funding pretty fast because of the archive just melting away. And so that, that was a good thing for, for us. Apart from the ice blocks, which are the major or the most important for our research. Obviously, these are perennial uh, types of deposits. Ephemeral are in the entrance and the in the lava tubes. Those are seasonal, and so we don't have any. In, uh, you know, they are fine. They are nice. They are aesthetically beautiful, but they don't uh, carry any information on the uh, pedoclimate environment and so forth. In terms of uh, methods that we use to, to do these paleoclimatic studies, and this one, it's mainly for the, the, you know, what types of archives that we can use. Of course, in the marine environment, corals and deep sea sediments are the most common ones. When we move into the continental settings, ice, mostly in big ice sheets and glaciers, and of course, in some of the caves. Cave deposits with speleothems, tree ring, pollen, and so forth, lake sediments, and guano. In lava tubes, we do have ice, gypsum, and guano that we can investigate and we can get nice information on, on uh, paleoclimate, paleo environment. I also have here an image in which shows these archives and what is the resolution of the record that we can, we can get. So cave deposits can be down uh, up to 10 uh, millions of years that you can work on and we can date sediments that are or carbonates that are that old. Lava tubes, unfortunately, uh, first of all, what we have inside, even if we know that they are very old, I will not find, or at least I, we could not find yet, an ice block that will be beyond Holocene, which is 10, 11,000 years old. Okay. So, uh, we are, what we are looking here is probably in, a, in terms of a couple of thousands of years that is uh, 
kind of a time period for our investigations. And before moving deeply into the into the, the talk, I just want to mention that uh, it's an we are trying and we are working now uh, with um, with the stable isotopes. And obviously, oxygen and hydrogen are the most important because of the ice. But the presence of uh, gypsum in all these lava tubes it's extremely important and the, uh, being able to use the, the 34 to 32 isotope ratio for sulfur, it's crucial in, for at least two reasons. One is that if we use this uh, method, this stable isotope method, uh, we can point out whether the gypsum in the cave is of volcanic origin, like in El Mal Pais, or it's marine in values are completely different. Look at this, 21 per mil. This is only two to four per mil. So that is very easy to uh, establish what was the source when the gypsum, for the gypsum that, that formed. Now, in addition to that, which we are working now to develop, is we can do the oxygen and hydrogen analysis in the hydration water in the gypsum, which is fantastic because the Isotopic signal in the oxygen and hydrogen, it's very, very particular. Look at, for, look at the values for meteoric, for seawater, or for hot fluids. So basically, if you have, if we have a big data set from, from a, an area with lava tubes and we have gypsum inside, we can date it, first of all. And then secondly, we can get this information about the hydration water, where it was coming from, and it you know, provides a sort of information. Unfortunately, gypsum deposits are not thick, so we will not have, say, 2,000 or 3,000 years of record. We will have just spot information about that particular gypsum. Still, it's good, or it's better than, than nothing. Uh, the, the way that, uh, the, the, the reason I, I mentioned gypsum is because gypsum also help us uh, establishing the age of the lava tubes. For many, uh, for many of the lava tubes, for instance, in, in El Amal Pais, uh, volcanologists already made all kinds of dates with um, chlorine 36, helium, 30, uh, helium 3, um, potassium argon, and so forth. So we knew almost all the, the lava tubes, the ages for them. However, there were a couple of systems that were not dated because there was no way to date them. So we tried the gypsum. And uh, we, we published a paper back in 2020 where we, we, uh, we show after testing gypsum from a, a number of lava tubes, and we found out that the, the ages with uranium thorium method gave exactly or very, very close values to the ages that were known from different other methods. So we were kind of encouraged and we said, okay, if that works, well, let's go and try to find the gypsum in these lava tubes that were not dated. And so uh, we can find out how old are the lava tubes. Knowing how old the lava tubes are, you can kind of say, okay, I cannot have eyes older than this, right? So we have a kind of a minimum age for the for the ice deposits within the within those particular lava tubes, and it was important at least in one of the lava tubes that we worked on in the El Mal Pais area. So, as I mentioned, oxygen and hydrogen isotopes are the most important for water studies, and since ice it's just frozen water, we are using uh, we, we are using um, uh, stable isotopes trying to track this nice pattern, this uh, movement of the air or the moisture from a, a reservoir to another one. For instance, in the, in the Southwestern um, United States, the oxygen isotopes will track really nicely the moisture shoes, whether it's coming from the Pacific or Gulf of California or from Gulf of Mexico. Values in the oxygen isotopes will be very, very different. In addition, we get information about the temperature, outside temperature at the time when the ice accumulate because the, 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 the fractionation of the isotopes, it's a temperature, it's a function of temperature. And we can also, if we have a good monitoring station, we, do, we can also infer the precipitation amount in, in some of the areas. For this, what we use is this small instrument, uh, $90,000 only, but it's portable. You can have it in the field. You can do the analysis right into the into the lava tubes. 
We collect very little amount of water, one milliliter we generally have, we filter it because there might be some impurities in, and then we transfer that with uh, uh, into a special vial that goes into this rack where we have the samples and we only need 0.8 uh, milliliters for, uh, for such an analysis. Precision it's up to 0 0.11 per mil, so it's, it's pretty good. When we have less uh, quantities of uh, water that are very, very small, we do have another option and we work with the uh, University of New Mexico uh, Center for Stable Isotopes, where we can use up to not more than, uh, sorry, not uh, when we have the water that is less than 300 microliters, we could still good, get very good results on the on those samples. So how the oxygen works is basically water evaporates in an area and as it moves, rain evaporates, rain evaporates, each time of, of each of these processes causes the oxygen values, oxygenized of values and hydrogen, of course, to change. And as we move inland, the values become lower and lower. And so we can track that path and basically uh, using the values of the oxygen, mostly oxygen, hydrogen will give us uh, other, uh, other sorts of information. We can track what the source of moisture is. In terms of sampling the ice, and I mentioned sometimes it's challenging. Most of the time we will use either, depends on how thick the ice is. We will use either a handheld Bosch instrument, for instance, with a, with a core that is about five, uh, five inches or sorry, five, five centimeters. But ideally is to use one of these uh, Kovach marks uh, corers, which are one meter long, we have extension roads, and it works with a portable uh, driller. They are very powerful, and you go down one, two, three meters, depends on how much you need to, and re you recover very nice ice cores outside from that uh, barrel that is that is right here. Well, that is, that's the case for the big Ice, uh, ice accumulations that are thicker, I would say, than half a meter. We need to use this one. However, we have situation when the ice, it forms a kind of a waterfall. So it's part of a big, larger ice block that is retreating. And so the ceiling being on top of us, we cannot sit on top of the ice to drill vertically. So we have to go and drill horizontally. We use ice screws, uh, climbing ice screws, and you just get into, screw them in, and in that, and this part of the of the screw, the ice comes out, you collect it in the vial and melt it at the room temperature and get it into the Picaro instrument and have the have the the the, the results. What is important to, to keep in mind is that we try to sample at the lowest or the, the highest resolution possible. It's very hard to cut ice. Uh, in the lab or in the in the cave. Special labs do have some particular instruments that will cut the ice, especially those who are working in the Arctic and in the Antarctica, uh, in Greenland as well. Uh, they can cut at you know half a centimeters or so. So for us to exp to be expediting the, the process, we uh, custom build uh, ice drill bits that were like 0.5 centimeters. So we drill very, very small holes just to get enough water for the uh, isotope analysis. At the same time, uh, from place to place, especially if we see that there are any impurities, which we hope, always hope that are organics transported from surface, uh, we were collecting small, we were cutting small disks of, water, uh, of ice, melted, uh, filtrating and then send it to the uh, radiocarbon uh, laboratories for having ages uh, on these samples. And we will talk about that a little bit more because we apply not only radiocarbon, but we also use the uranium series method. So in order to create the ice chronology, we have these three major methods. Radiocarbon is by far the, the, the easiest and the fastest because, you know, just take the organic, send it, and you will have the age in, in four or five days, six days or so forth. You can do it in organics, it's ideal, but you can also do in dissolve in organic carbon. But for that, you have to be sure that when you collect the sample, you 
put it in a vacuum place and send it to the lab and they will take from being still in the vacuum take out what is in and prepare it for for dating because we don't want to uh to mix the inorganic carbon that is in the ice that came came into the lava tube from the dripping from above with the carbon that is uh you know co2 that is now in the in the lava tube uh, atmosphere inside the inside the tube Uranium thorium, it was a method that we tried to use. So radiocarbon, all, all of you probably are very familiar with the method. It goes back 40, 45,000 uh, years. So it's ideal, again, if we have organics in the, in the core. Uranium thorium was a kind of a backup uh, plan, especially on some of, the, some of the ice cores where there was just pure nice ice, transparent ice. We could not see any traces of organic. So we had to get the chronology, otherwise isotopes will tell nothing. And so we use uranium thorium. It's the process, it's simple. You know, these are igneous rocks. The results are igneous, it's an igneous rock. So you might have uranium inside, obviously. And as it is uh, uh, dissolved and transported into with the water drips and accumulates in the ice. So you can, go back and do the ratio between uranium and thorium, how much thorium formed from the uranium, and you will get an age. With the age, you can go up to 600,000. It's not the case in our lava tubes, but for caves, normal caves, it's it's really uh, the best method to, to establish a chronology. The, uh, the, third, the the third method that we, we, we tried to use was to find sulfate peaks in our, in our ice cores, which means, when you have a volcanic eruptions, there is a sulfur, it's a SO2 component that gets into the atmosphere. And that one, you can extract, you can find it if you do a small chemical analysis. You analyze the, the, uh, your eyes for, for sulfate and also for sodium. And then you do this math. You do the, uh, uh, the, the, the atmospheric sulfate. It's whatever is the total sulfate minus 0.25 multiplied by sodium present. So that this part here gets rid of all can that all sulfate that can be of marine origin. And so if you take from the total sulfate that you have the marine one, you are just left with a SO4 that came off the volcanic eruptions. And so you will have peaks like this here and there that will mark events, volcanic events. It's a trick with that. Let's go to see how that works. So this is the upper part of one of the lava tube 29, and we have like 40, 50, 59 centimeters, 54, 59 centimeters of, of ice right here. All these black places that I highlighted are locations where I collected uh, samples for radiocarbon, and it's all charcoal inside. So we were very, very lucky to have charcoal, a lot of charcoal in this, in this uh, part of the ice core. And using the charcoal and additional three uranium, uranium thorium dates, we managed to create an age depth model, which would allow us to say exactly where, at what age, what the stabilized of value was, so that I can do the reconstruction as well as, uh, as uh, yeah, as well as I, I, I can. The other image right here is uh, places where we collect the water. We analyze it, but actually we collect it everywhere. But in these spots here, we got these peaks that you see here. And all these spikes represent volcanic eruptions. You will have to go back knowing what the, what age is, what at least one age that you have on the, on the ice core. You will try to match these peaks with known volcanic eruptions. So it's a, it's a sort of indirect chronology that you can get. But if you don't have any other means, it will work. Otherwise, we want to stick with radiocarbon and uranium thorium ages. So we are coming to the human presence in lava tubes. Uh, one of the studies we had back in 2020 came up when we start visiting some of the lava tubes and we encounter huge amounts of charcoal inside. And it's not only that it's inside, you see the stick here is one meter. So it's pretty high pile of, of charcoal. The funny thing is that that charcoal, it's somewhere in this area right here of the lava tube. So the entrance in the lava tube is this collapse right here. You go down, down, you kind of down slope a little bit, you climb up and then you come to this point right here. You see the profile right here. Basically you have to 
um, crawl to get into the second part of the lava tube. So whoever did this, did it with a purpose. I mean, I would, like a normal person, I will not, I will not go beyond that point and stay there and do something unless I need to do it very much. It's a nasty crawl that you have to do it right there. And so on all this area, we find ice. This is the location of the ice block that we investigated. Uh, ice, it's also here, but the big ice block, it's right here in this small cove here. And this is the image of the ice. And then right on top, we found this beautiful piece of ceramic pottery that apparently the archaeologists that we were working with said it's one of the uh, about 900 AD uh, typical um, ceramic in the in the area. So whoever get into that cave obviously passed this narrow passage and set fire for some reasons. So our hypothesis on this in this paper was that humans knew, well Indians probably knew or let me let me put it differently, uh, bas basket makers, I guess that's the, the, the term the term for uh, they knew about these ice blocks inside and being at a high altitude, being very dry and being no water on the lava flows, they had to know these locations and get into to retrieve some water. The only way they could, they could do it, set up some fires and collect the melted water. Early times, probably there were some animal skins and then later on came all these, uh, the, the pottery vases. So. Uh, they they had there and so all this charcoal because we dated everything here and in the the charcoal itself in the lower part it's um, it's about um, uh 11000 no sorry it's about 14 1400 ad the 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 age on that and then goes back down to about 200 ad okay and so Obviously, the people were coming in into the lava tubes, crawling in, knowing that it's ice, setting the fire, small fires, because otherwise the smoke could have killed them, but enough just to melt the amount of water they, they would need. So we were looking after we did the, uh, the, the dating, we found out these five intervals. These are the dates that we had. All of these dates correspond and the yellow bands right here shows periods when it was drier than normal uh, based on the precipitation anomaly. This is tree ring based reconstruction. This is the Palmer uh, drought uh, severity index. It's also based on tree rings reconstructions. And this is a cave, uh, a cave reconstruction right here, where the thickness of the calcite lamina, is sh it's showing here, it's going down, it's going down, it's going very down, and all this corresponds with the periods when uh, charcoal occur inside the ice in the ice uh, core. Because again, uh, in the image right here, you do see these black areas where the the ice uh, the charcoal was was found. So knowing that and you know, visiting other lava tubes in El Malpais, we found in uh, eight of those quite large uh, and uh, important accumulation of charcoal. Fragments that were inside the ice, fragments that was just below an ice layer, fragments that were close by in a, top a topography of a lava tube that re uh, resembled the ones with the big ice blocks. Each time we will have some ice all, uh, sorry, in some charcoals, and we assume there was ice because inside there was also uh, ceramics and other other small artifacts present there. So we dated everything in uh, in these caves, in these lava tubes, and what we found that the oldest ceramic and uh, charcoal are about four thousand years, uh, and then. That was just, just the very beginning. So the guys were just going in and figure out, well, there's ice there, let's melt it and use the water. Later on, this cave, uh, Lava Tube 29, this is the one that has uh, very much uh, charcoal inside. And that is where, where we got many, many samples and a lot of charcoal and usage of the 
of the ice um, or harvesting of the ice in the in the lava tube. So there are many other many re, many periods when we have the ice being harvested in the caves. And on this diagram, what I'm showing is that again we have the precipitation, whether it's July or whether it's the November uh, November March interval. Each time when we have these uh, uh, dates, radiocarbon dates on charcoal, each time most of them corresponds with bands that signifies you know a little bit of drying or dry longer dried periods like this one it's a long dried period right and so we we assume that all the, the presence of this charcoal inside the ice ice cores or in some of the caves that are without ice anymore represents remains of what was once upon a time uh a, an intense ice harvesting in the in the area well, we have two samples right here in lava tube 91. The entrance in lava tube 99 is vertical. It's about 60 feet drop, and then it's another 60 feet downslope till you get to a very nice large room with a thick, two meters thick ice block in. Chances for a human 7,000 years ago, even 5,000 years ago, to get into that, I, I would say it's zero. So we assume, and that's why I frame them right here. We assume this is a micro charcoal and most likely uh, uh, accumulated, but accumulated in the ice due to some fires, uh, forest fire or something like that, and the uh, water carried out that micro charcoal inside the the the, the cave. So. <clears throat> Obviously, we do have signs of human presence in lava tubes starting 4,000 years ago, but these two, which push the, the, the age of the ice in, uh, in one of the lava tubes to 7,000, obviously, these are not hum, uh, human-made. So when you're looking at the oxygen, so we have chronology, we have the dates now with the, with the charcoal, the presence of the charcoal, we start to analyze the, the, the information that we got on the Delta O18. And I plotted here that the three major cores that we had from, uh, from the lava tubes, La lava tube 29, 455, and 91. Uh, I have to mention that, that these two provided very nice uh, charcoal and uh, organics that allow to create the chronology. So 7,000 to about 1,000. Most, I'm not sorry, most, all of, the, of, of our samples, which were in ice, ended at around 900. Um, AD. We don't have anything. We, we do have younger than that, but that is just charcoal inside the, the lava tube, not in the ice. So we have a 6,000 years history of some, uh, some something going on there. So having ice that covers 7,000 years allowed us to look very carefully about uh, switches between sources of moisture from Gulf of Mexico or the, from the Pacific. So in the diagram right here, what we are seeing is that uh, what is, we have the moisture transport. In the summer, you can see you can have a lot of rain coming from the Gulf, and we know that this is the case, and these events are very large sometimes. But in the winter, like this is December to March, most of the precipitation comes from the, from the West Pacific, and sometimes we have something from Gulf of California. Okay, so... <clears throat> We know from the present day conditions that that is what we would expect. So knowing that and having the isotopes here, we notice that there are big, big swings. You know, this is minus four. This is minus 12. So Gulf of Mexico water precipitation normally is like minus six to minus two, whereas Pacific is anywhere between minus 12 and minus seven, sometimes even lower than minus 12. So obviously periods where we when we have these lower values, has to be something that came predominantly from the uh, from the West. Now, I'm, I I didn't mention earlier, and you might ask, well, if you have rain coming from two sources, why it, each one will create or regenerate ice? What we believe after monitoring two years in the in the area is that ice is forming in the late spring. Inside the lava tubes, it's very cold. And late spring, when the snow starts melting, and all that snow, it's mainly west moisture, brought by west moisture. Snow melts, water drips into the, into the lava tubes, 
and freezes and form a lake. That lake accumulates lay, lay, layer after layer and generates the blocks that we uh, core. In the summertime, what happens is you have these big monsoon rains coming over. Well, the surface, it's so hot because of the black, uh, black uh, basalts. Most of the rains that comes, it has to be super, super heavy to manage to have some of that water penetrating and getting into the lava tubes. Otherwise, it will evaporate as soon as it hits the, the basalts. Well, from the data that we have in the lava tubes, the ice, now, now we are sure that in some periods there was enough, uh, enough rain or very, very uh, um, strong events that caused water from the monsoon rains to penetrate and get into the into the ice. What happens at that time is that the a layer of ice that was frozen and formed from water, from meltwater of Pacific origin, will be partly melted and so the water will mix, which will cause the values to change a little bit and not being so negative, but not super positive. Right, and so this fluctuation, this also this uh, range allows us to to quantify how much water was coming from one area. Was it a period of very high intense monsoon, or it was a period of El Nino or La Nina? It depends on which one we want to look at. And La Nina is very important because that's that's something that brings a lot of a lot of things with. So. Here we have the data. We plotted our 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 uh, oxygen isotopes and then compare with other records. And before I'm going into this, uh, <clears throat> uh, into a little bit more detail, I just want to show you here. So this is our area right here. And what happens from a climatic point of view, apart from you know what the the, the rain source that comes from this direction or from this direction, we have the inter tropical convergence zone, that is a kind of a rain bell that move, moves up and down in the summer and the winter and brings more precipitation or less precipitations. So apparently that is kind of important, but it's also important. So this is in the summertime, you know, so when you have a low pressure right here, which allows uh, precipitation from the Gulf of Mexico to penetrate all into New Mexico, Arizona and so forth. In the winter time, uh, in our area, when we have El Nino conditions, then it's super wet. So that is when we get all those snowing and we have the snow accumulated, ac accumulating in the mountains, it's high elevation there. So in the spring, it starts melting and gets into the cave where it freezes. So this is the time, I would say the generating time of the, of the ice. In the summer, uh, sorry, in the in the winter when we have La Nina conditions, it's much more drier in our area. And research that was carried out on lake sediments, on tree rings, and uh, other archives pointed out that, or noticed that, when we have a year or a winter with La Nina, because it's not much snow on the ground, that will cause the next summer to be drier, especially if you don't have a North, Atlant uh, North American monsoon in intense events, then uh, the, 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 the summer will be even drier. So we looked and tried to compare with all the data that we found for the time interval between 7,000 and 1,000 years ago. And we look at uh, records of El Nino, and we found that, you know, for instance, El Nino was dominant in this last 2,000 years, what, 2,000, between 3,000 and 1,000 years in some of the sediments. And we noticed that some of the intense peaks right here corresponds with our peaks in the in most negative peaks in our, in our ice record, which indicates that, yes, that was a, an El Nino event that created the snow that melt and generate the ice. So we see that those are aligning very, very nicely with all the, almost all the records in the <clears throat> in the different areas. So we choose we choose the caves from New Mexico, caves from uh, uh, from Mexico. Uh, we do have some um, uh, some uh, something from uh, from the Gulf of Mexico that will gives us the amount of uh, monsoon rain and. Uh, Looking at all this, all this uh, data, so all the all the the data that comes out from the from the stable isotopes, 
what we were able to conclude, it was that periods when it's a, a weak or absent El Nino, each time will favor the drought conditions in the Southwest. La Nina, especially if it's associated with uh, another, another system, which is the Pacific Decadal uh, Oscillation, that will trigger even more severe uh, droughts in the Southwest. La Nina, and as I mentioned, when it's a weak NAM, uh, North American monsoon, that means you will have summer or summers with uh, less rain and less uh, less uh, humidity inherited from the from the winter precipitation, and so the droughts it's more uh, are more intense. Even when we have strong North Atlantic uh, North American monsoon activity, if it's coupled with the La Nina or with the or a very weak El Nino, which means we are not getting winter precipitation to kind of re <clears throat> refill the, the amount of snow in the mountains, that will also increase the likelihood of, uh, of droughts. Uh, we believe uh, from the from comparing the data and looking some of the some of the samples uh, uh, calcite samples from caves in Mexico and Guatemala, we believe that the southward shift of the ITCZ, the intertropical convergence zones, it will weaken the, uh, the monsoon and that will induce drier intervals. So all this, all, all this kind of, um, <clears throat> all this information basically are surfacing out from the from the data that we collected on the on the oxygen isotopes and so far we had no yet time to look at the hydrogen hydrogen is very important for for moisture to characterize uh, to characterize not only the source but also the actually the uh, evaporation at the source of the of the moisture that's something that one of the students at one point has to to deal with so uh, I guess that is all what I had to to uh, present, and I am open to answer questions. Well, thank you so much, Bogdan. That was fantastic, man. Your your conclusions there have so many implications for like uh, how these different conditions would impact uh, ancestral Pueblo people in the Southwest. Um, a lot of different impacts for agriculture or foraging that could be like come off from those. Um, so we've got a number of questions. Um, we'll start. Let's see. Where are we going to start? Um, well, uh, well, someone actually recently just asked, could you explain how the isotopic differences in the water arise from various oceans or regions? Well, in the ocean, the, the values are zero. So as soon as you start evaporating the water from the ocean, if you are in the tropical area, you will have certain values. If you go north, it will be lower values. So the temperature is what controls what controls the uh, the differences between the isotopic values. What also controls is how long the uh, water vapors are moving across landscape. So if they have to cross over a mountain range, you start from zero or minus two, for instance, and you will get to minus 12 by the time you are in Colorado, okay? So temperature is very important. Altitude is very important. Um, amount of precipitation is very important because the values will differ. So if you have a very little, a very small rain, but it's very hot in the Southwest, it evaporates and the values are completely different, are much more positive than they should. Whereas if you have big rainstorms that and the evaporation is very, very small, then the values will be the same, or almost the same with what we would expect for that area. So temperature is extremely important and that is what controls most of the values. Thank you so much. Um, we have a number of questions coming in. Um, did you find any petroglyphs or any other rock art inside the lava tubes or outside or nearby? There are, but that was not my, not, that was not my doing. Uh, what we found, it was a lot of ceramic. And again, ceramic, it's almost always associated with caves that once upon a time had ice or still have ice in. So what I didn't, what I didn't mention in my presentation, because I'm not an archaeologist, so but I work with them. 
But what they believe, for instance, because we don't have almost no uh, serious har ice harvesting beyond 800 AD. Mm -hmm. Archaeologists believe at that point something happened, well, probably like happened in Cacho Canyon and in Mesa. Probably people just moved from there. They found out that it's not the best place, not the best climate, and they probably went along the Rio Grande or who knows where. Um, yeah, one of the things, selfishly speaking, as a zoo archaeologist, I think there are actually um, uh, ethnographic, like ethnographic recordings of people using the lava tubes to store animals. That's um, correct. We found that. Oh, you! What kind yeah. of animal remains did you find? Big ones, big games. Oh wow, that's yes. that is so amazing. That was in the very end of a passage where it, even now it's about zero degree. So obviously that was ice before there. And so that was the place where they kept that one. And in another part, they have their water source. And then mm -hmm. in the very remote other side, they built a small fortress that had three different entrances in case of. Oh, that's, that is fascinating. Um, someone asks, what kind of like volume of water could people actually collect um, in the kind of methods that they were using? Is there any kind of calculations around that? Uh, in, in the paper that we published, we tried to figure out how much ice was melt because uh, as the ice forms, it will, it, it will leave like a bathtub mm -hmm. line on the walls. So we know where the ice was and we, we saw different locations where, you know, it went down and down and down. Based on the amount of charcoal, you know, they must, must have... Um, uh, melted a lot of water in uh, at least in cave 29 a lot of water i mean i have the calculation i don't have the numbers because they are they are terrible large i would say wow. <clears throat> so that would show that we, we could not say for for over what period of times because we find the charcoal in the ice for say uh 200 AD, and then we found it at 360 or uh, 500. So we don't know whether it was intervals when it was extremely dry outside and the guys were sitting there for a couple of years, well, not inside, but coming mm -hmm. over, over and over to the same location to melt. How much at the time? You know, at the early time, basket maker, apparently they didn't have only skin stuff to carry. So obviously there was small amounts one of the archaeologists that we were working uh, mentioned that probably uh, it was probably for drinking, especially for those who were hunting in the area, but possibly the water was also harvested for rituals. Hmm. And so, because it was considered pure water and so forth. And so uh, probably the beginning, it was not, it was not uh, large quantities, but later on, because ne next to some of the lava tubes, there are uh, those... Uh, I think it were habitations because there are some cir circles, uh, blocks of um, bazaars that were built and probably covered with something. So we believe those were hunting camps or something like that. And at that time, they, they would extract quite a lot of ice. Mm -hmm. um, uh, just a kind of a nerdy question, I guess, a really nerdy one is, you know, these, if it's this quantity, I didn't realize it was like kind of like this quantity of water that you were talking about. Um, like methodologically, how does that, can you see that? Uh, and I, 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 I couldn't really see it so much with the, with the data that you had presented, but like, can you, that level of like melting, does it mess with your chronology at all? Do you have to control for that in some way? Oh, no. Oh, okay. Good. Very good question. So this was a big, large lava tube, right? That had an alcove. So the guys okay. were melting in the in the middle part, probably on top, and then they went on the sides or whatever as they were setting up the fire. Because we found some small holes in the uh, in the in the floor, we assumed that were the holes were made specifically to drain the water in to be easy for them to take them out. Mm -hmm. So the ice block that is left now in one of the caves, it's on an alcove. So what happened was, as soon as they would start the fire, sparks will just fly over. And so some of those landed on our eyes. The uh -huh. fact that we see in the ice, ice uh, core, the charcoal in stratigraphic chronology. So all the ages are from older to younger. And I'm, I don't have anything mixed up 
that tells me that on that area, they didn't touch because like you are saying, if they start melting, obviously we'll mess everything. So we were lucky that the ice block on that alcove was left probably for the bad times, but they never, never had to go there. Oh man, that, that's amazing. Okay, we're going to have one last question, and a number of people have asked this one, and then we're going to be very respectful of your time, Bogdan. No and, worries. I'm, I'm happy to we'll, answer your questions. We'll call it after this one. Um, so how are ice cores kept for future use and reference? How are they stored? Uh, there are several locations where ice, it's, uh, it's stored. So the ice core gets out. You can cut it and put it in uh, freezing freezing boxes and then carry it to the lab and then in the lab you have them in the in the in the freezers i have 26 meters of ice from one of the ice caves in romania in the freezer here at the lab so we have it like large large fragments the other option is to take it like a meter or two exactly like the ones are doing in greenland and you have to have special boxes pad it with um, dry dry um, CO2 and then just ship it as soon as possible to, to get it as soon as possible into the cold cold room. So it will stay there and it um, yeah, it's preserved and other people can work when you know technology will be so that you will need a microliter, not what we are using now. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Amazing. Yeah, though I you know I worked at the UNM, you know, I worked with uh, I got my PhD from UNM. So the Center for Stable Isotopes is um pretty oh, it's yeah. just amazing it's an it's amazing, amazing. And yeah. nowadays it's even more because they got a new building and completely uh -huh. oh, oh yeah <laughs> all the stuff is there yeah so yeah it's very fancy it's very nice well everyone um thank you so much for coming Bogdan this was fantastic this was a great talk thank you so much for your time um we My really pleasure. appreciate it so much thank you so all right much everyone. for inviting me all right all right. Have a good one. All right, everyone. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.